May I speak to you in the name of the one true God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I love those, those moments in stories or in film or in life when a person is left in a state of marveling speechlessness by what they've just heard another person say. You know those types of characters and people they're going on and on about a particular opinion or worldview, sure of a particular point. And then the person they're speaking with drops some truth or a challenge to an opinion or their worldview. And then the person just stops, recalibrates a bit, and is left with a deepening of understanding, a deepening of awareness and reality, perspective and truth. I know that I've been on both sides of that sort of discussion in my life. I've heard people go on about a particular myopic view or a misguided belief, and my conscience says to me, challenge them a bit. And so I offer a different way of seeing the thing they have an opinion about or a belief in. And the person usually stops and dwells in silence for a bit, changed by a different perspective. I know that I've had those moments of marveling when my own beliefs or worldviews have been challenged and redirected by people who are wiser than me. And I marvel at their wisdom and their willingness to be candid and frank and help me expand my viewpoint, my beliefs. I suppose that's what civil discourse is partly about. It's about a willingness to come to the proverbial table with sometimes opposing beliefs and views and be challenged and be changed. I think we can all agree that civil discourse is always needed, especially in the areas of politics, religion, otherwise. And it seems like it's needed more and more lately. But the Christian enters into civil discourse differently. The Christian hopes to come to the table of opposition with the love of God directing them. In this morning's gospel passage from St. Matthew, we see the political religious leaders of the day having their perspectives challenged and rearranged by Jesus. He leaves them actually marveling, which is how Jesus usually leaves people, usually leaves us marveling at his words, his wisdom, stuck in marveling speechlessness. This short passage has many different elements together combined within leadership, pride, malice, politics, money. The Jewish elite, the Pharisees, along with the Herodians, who are those who followed Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch, go up to Jesus while he's teaching, and they try to trap him. In the Greek, to trap, the word here, le means literally to, to lay a snare, as if a hunter would, to trap an animal. By asking something that would incriminate him, they try to trap him in this way, so that Jesus could possibly be handed over to the Roman authorities for trial or even death. So they enter into this conversation with Jesus, the Pharisees and the Herodians, already aware of the ends they want to come out of this encounter. How often do we do that in life? Enter into a conversation with someone we disagree with, with the goal of that conversation already in mind, unaware that we might actually be changed and challenged by the encounter, that the ends that we've imagined may actually not come true, or even worse in our double-mindedness, the ends that we've imagined as being inevitable might actually be wrong. They went to Jesus to incriminate him, and they want him to say something that say something to the effect that paying taxes to Caesar is wrong. And the taxes referenced here most likely the types of taxes people would have paid on any agricultural yield or property 
it would have amounted to about a denarius a year, which was a lot for some people. But then Jesus says the famous words in another translation, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's. In other words, pay what is owed and respect the authority of government. Jesus was not setting up a religion of anarchists. And what is the reaction of the Pharisees and Herodians somewhat surprised by this pronouncement? We're told in another translation, when they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away, silent. So, okay, we know what render to Caesar might have meant in Jesus' day. The question now is, what do we render to God? I think we must render to God our time. And as a result of the time we render, we give, we will render to God also our willingness to marvel at what he says to us. Again, I think we render to God our time, and as a result of that, we render to God to our willingness, our abilities to marvel at what he says to us now in life. Recently, in the prayer class I'm teaching, I shared a story some of you might know. John Vianney, a saint, who was a priest in France in the 18th century, first told this story. Vianney, the priest, would go into his church and would see the same old peasant man sitting in the pew in the church and this man would be staring out into space, or so it seemed, to the priest. Vianney noticed one day that the man was not staring into space, but that the old peasant was staring at the wooden tabernacle where the consecrated hosts are kept, the consecrated sacrifice from the altar is kept. So one day, Vianney, the priest, asks this peasant, why do you come in here and just stare at the tabernacle all day? And the man turns to Vianney and calmly says, I look at God and God looks at me. I look at God and God looks at me. The old man knew what it meant to render to God what is God's. He knew that God desires for us to desire him. And I'm sure Vianney was left in marveling speechlessness after he heard the peasant say those very profound words. And we can assume that Vianney assumed the old man was just being idle or sitting there without any purpose but the exact opposite was occurring in that prayer. The man there sitting was adoring God. He sat there in the purest form of prayer, that of drawing closer to God so that God will draw closer to us. I hope that each of us will continue drawing closer to God. In these days where we hear about such sickening religious conflict, and we can be confused to believe that people of faith are committing such acts of barbarity and such sin. In these times, it's important to draw close to God all the more. If only each person on this earth prayed the way that peasant did. Even if we think we're laying aside enough time even if we think we're committing our hearts anew to God each day enough, there's always more we can do because God desires it. God doesn't desire the hatred that's in the heart of man. God doesn't desire that humans make enemies. And God certainly does not desire sinful acts and murder and chaos committed in his holy name. God desires only for us to desire him, to desire his will as it is revealed in scripture, 
And also he desires us to love as if our lives depend on it. All we need to do to make a difference in this sin-sick and often evil world is to dwell with God. To render to God what is due his name, it might look idle to those looking in, as if it's not going to make a big difference. But it's something we all can do. It may seem small, but if only all met God each day that way, I think the whole world would be speechless. Speechless.